<laughs> well, say that then. <laughs> Growing up in the inner city in the mid-90s, I experienced a different type of upbringing. Both of my parents fell victim to the crack epidemic, as did most of the other adults around me. My mother tried her best to care for all five of her kids as a single parent on every public assistance program available. However, one night when I was about 10 years old, in the midst of a cocaine high, her and my oldest sister got into an altercation and my mom stabbed her multiple times in the stomach. This led to me and my siblings being split up and put into the foster care system. I then would turn and latch on to gang life. This, for the most part, spawned out of the need for me to connect with something that was deemed to be bigger than my reality. Once I made this decision, my whole entire lifestyle revolved around it. I was all in. There weren't many role models or what you would consider upstanding citizens to look up in Logan Heights anyway, look up to in Logan Heights anyway. Like something as simple as fathers who went to work every day. For that matter, there were barely any two-parent households. So the only ones left to turn to were the older gang members and hustlers who were only out to get high and make money by any means necessary. During my teenage years, I got into a lot of trouble I stayed in and out of the juvenile court system for some things I did and didn't do alike. In one instance, I was charged with acting in concert with two other individuals in a robbery for just standing there. We were walking through a local trolley station and the two guys I was with approached two other teens on some random gang affiliation shit. I asked them where they were from and made them give up a few bucks and some jewelry. Nobody was hurt, and only about $20 and some jewelry was taken, and all the contents were found on the other two guys I was with. One of the guys was released on house arrest three days later and never served any time for the offense. The other was sent to the California Youth Authority as a minor, so there was no strike involved. And I was tried as an adult because I had been in juvenile hall for two prior offenses and a few violations. This led to me taking a plea bargain for a strike and probation for just standing there, literally. I agreed to this deal, not being able to fully comprehend the impact of what having a strike on my record for something so stupid would have on me years later. I now realize today that the district attorney knew they had no case had I went to trial. So they wanted to sell upon me the fact that I would be immediately released knowing all along the true burden that strike will hold against me. And sadly, I took the bait. A few months later, the burden of that strike would go into effect. At 17, I was charged with an assault that I wasn't even present at until the crime that had been committed was over. I was told by detectives to either give up the person who committed the act or the charges would stick. This pissed me the fuck off. The fact that they could play with the course of my life just because they felt like it was not the business. Deanne Carter, a gang detective, came into the police station with her partner shortly after I was placed under arrest. She then placed a photo album onto a desk and started showing me random pictures of other gang members from my neighborhood. She then told me that they knew it was a good possibility that I did not commit the crime because the victim had been kicked and nose busted up pretty badly, and I didn't have a trace of blood on me or my shoes. Given that information, she asked me to identify who it was through a photograph and said if I refused, the charges would stick. I told her that I knew I was a fuck up, but they didn't have shit on me this time around. Also, that I was willing to take a lie detector test to prove it. She told me she didn't care and all that mattered was the fact that she would be getting another West Coast Crip gang member off the streets. She then stated that she couldn't understand why I was unwilling to cooperate and risk throwing my life away for a neighborhood who had multiple informants that I would be surprised by. Like a true gangster, I refused her offer and would pay a heavy price. I had no idea what I was in for. I would end up spending the next 10 years of my life incarcerated from age 17 to 27, to be exact. 
I remember one day in prison, I woke up thinking about how there had to be more than life than the way I was living. Being fed through a tray slot, latched onto a door, constantly witnessing violence and occasional deaths, and being around lifers with nothing to lose, and only being permitted 90 minutes out of my cell was definitely no way to live. The guards bringing in phones and drugs, selling them to us, doubling back, taking them just to sell them to us again. So I began to think about what it was going to take to change the direction of my life and not succumb to the bullshit. I decided I had to let go of my game banging mentality. Once I did that, I felt as if I was no longer psychologically enslaved and words can't express the freedom I felt while still being incarcerated. I acknowledged to myself that the odds were gonna be stacked against me, especially given the two strikes I had hanging over my head since the day I turned 17, but I was gonna win. I then sat down with one of the smartest individuals I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. This man was self-taught into heavy sociology and carried with him a humbleness and understanding the world would probably never get to know. His name was Rock B from Compton. He'd been incarcerated over 20 years at the time and came to grips with the fact that he was never getting out. Therefore, he made it his business to impart on me every piece of knowledge and piece of wisdom he could. Some of the most important things I remember him telling me were, nothing, nothing in life worth having will come easy for us. And faith is believing in what you can't see and knowing that it exists. And the only thing he asked from me in return was that I get out and win. That way he could live vicariously through me. That's exactly what I plan to do. Upon the completion of my sentence, I accumulated 35 plus college units through correspondence courses. I would then transfer them all to San Diego City College and pursue an associate's degree for transfer in sociology. At this very point in time, I'm on track to accomplish my goal this year, but my life still continues to be heavily impacted by the mistakes of my youth, which I'm literally still facing the music for today. I was recently given a job at a group home. I would have been working with at-risk youth who I could identify with based on some of my life experiences. They paid for my physical examination and assured me that they would sign a letter of exemption when it came to my record in order to get me in. Surprisingly, when that time came, the state of California stepped in and denied the group home the opportunity to follow through with this exemption. They said that one of the cases dating back to me being 16 years old disqualified me from obtaining a proper license in that field. How am I ever supposed to get ahead in my life if something as far back as my teenage years continues to haunt me? Have I been pursuing my education in vain? Don't they realize that individuals that come from backgrounds like mine self-actualize at a much later time in life than what's deemed to be normal? Not to mention, whatever happened to a second chance? Shit, if you want to get technical, what about a first? This was amazing to me, being that I've come so far from that point in my life. For example, learning how to control the urges that lead down the wrong road and being able to control my thinking and actions should mean a lot. Not too many people arrive at this point after being exposed to the circumstances and situations that I have. Also, not only can I identify and empathize with these children from personal experience, I'm in the process of finishing up and earning that degree in sociology. I'm also in the process of trying to appeal this decision, which reminds me about the day I called Sacramento to inquire about their decision. They told me that the odds were very slim that I would win my appeal and that I should just find another field because in order to get around the ruling, I would have to be pardoned by the governor. This conversation got me hella mad. I wanted to climb through the phone and ask this person, who were they to shit on my hopes and dreams? Try to at least. <laughs> However, afterwards, I realized that just because in their mind they felt it wasn't possible, didn't mean I had to accept agree, or feed off into their negativity. On an even larger scale, based on my background, once again, I've already been held back from so much. 
mainly the opportunity at a normal life from the start. In reality, like most people who grew up like me, we never really got a first chance. None of us get to pick who our parents are or what type of environment we'll be raised in. So it's hard for me to understand why I have to continue to face the music for crimes that took place 13 and 14 years ago when I was a teenager. I guess our system didn't account for or figure a low life like myself would ever be able to grow enough mentally to understand life and stay away from the recidivism rate. Lately, I've been sitting and thinking about Maslow's hierarchy, about how when people's basic needs aren't met first, they won't ever be able to self-actualize. They'll be stuck like crabs in a bucket, pulling each other down even further. I've also been wondering if they'll ever understand the impact of their decision. I mean, I could take being denied a job, but they did more than just that. They denied me an opportunity to change the course of my life and escape the deaths of a subculture that still continues to haunt me to this day. All for some things that transpired when I was literally just a kid. Had I received that job, it would have led to so many different doors opening for me. Meeting different people, impacting lives, and being not only an example, but a testimony of change in my community. How can you pass up or not see the power in that? How could you? It's almost as if everyone's advocacy for change is an illusion. Coming from the extremes that I come from, it's very common for individuals to experience the tribulations that I have. You would think that once a person makes the transition mentally to become a productive citizen, there will be more options and avenues available to help aid and assist them, opposed to all the laws and avenues that promote a continued stagnation of growth and keep individuals like myself from self-actualizing and pursuing a reality far, great, far greater than what they've been accustomed to. Yet and still, I believe that one day our lawmakers will have to face the same music I've been facing in terms of some of these so-called tough on crime laws who affect individuals like myself and also hinder minorities that come from marginalized backgrounds one day.